I think we'll get started now. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to have people here in Pierce Hall. It's wonderful to see you all live. And uh, welcome to everybody who's live streaming um, our Grand Rounds today. So I want to thank you for coming to the annual Jack H. Mendelssohn Memorial Award celebration. Today we're celebrating the legacy of Dr. Jack Mendelssohn and the achievements of Dr. Kate McHugh, our 2022 Mendelssohn Award honoree. Not 2023, this is our 2022 scheduled for 2023, which is when we could have the presentation. So that's not an error. I first met and was inspired by Dr. Jack Mendelssohn a long time ago when he presented a lecture on the biology and genetics of alcohol use disorder when I was a second year medical student. It was really actually very inspiring to me at that time. And then I then had the chance to benefit again from his mentorship and support as a resident in psychiatry at McLean. And once again, when I joined McLean as a new faculty member. And I wasn't the only beneficiary, beneficiary of, of Jack's mentorship. He was a dedicated and well-respected researcher, a mentor of many investigators in alcohol and drug use disorders, and a pioneer in the investigation of biological and behavioral aspects of substance use disorders. He was really among the very first to bring a multidisciplinary collaboration of investigators evolving technologic innovations and also the organized research administration to this specific field of study. And he founded the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Research Center, or well, what we know of as ADARC, which was located in the Oaks Building for many, many years. And the ADARC was a landmark, internationally recognized center of research in addiction and made seminal discoveries in medications such as buprenorphine and also in sex differences in alcohol, cocaine, and other substances. His findings really revolutionized scientific understanding of substance use behavior, but it really also stimulated a new generation of behavioral and biological researchers. Through this prestigious award, we are able to recognize Dr. Mendelssohn's invaluable legacy to addiction research and to McLean Hospital. And it's really a great honor to present this award annually to someone who builds on the efforts of pioneers like Jack. So at this juncture, I'm going to invite Dr. Roger Weiss, the Chief of the Division of Alcohol, Drugs, and Addiction, to introduce this year's recipient, Dr. Kate McHugh. Roger. Thank you, Shelley. Um, having worked with Jack Mendelson for many years, I know that he would be delighted with this year's recipient, Dr. Kate McHugh. Um, I wish I'd been invited to introduce Dr. McHugh to talk about all the things that she hasn't done, because that would have been quick. Um, <laughs> but um, she has, in fact, done a great deal. She's a graduate of Harvard College. She got a PhD in clinical psychology at Boston University. In between that time, she was a research assistant here, and we couldn't wait to get her back. And uh, after her internship at Brown, um, with a, uh, we were successful at recruiting her back, and she has been spectacular. Um, she's the classic triple threat, great clinician, great researcher, great educator, has multiple uh, grants from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, 160 plus publications, um, many, many awards that she'll add to this one, including the David Shekow Early Career Award for Distinguished um, Scientific Contribution to Clinical Psychology from the American Psychological Association. Um, she's got about 10 other awards, but I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, and as brilliant as she is, she's a better person. So um, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. McHugh. All right, thank you so much, Roger and, and Shelley. It's actually pretty special to have two mentors of mine for um, actually two decades now. It's our, our two decade um, collegial anniversary for anyone who's keeping score in 2023. Um, and just t two people from whom I've, I've learned just a tremendous amount and who make it fun to come to work every day. Um, so much appreciated. Um, and thank you for everyone um, for being here and waiting 
until one o'clock to have your lunch. There, there is no, no greater gift you all could give me. So great, great to see you all here, and we'll see if I can figure out how to advance this. There we go. Um, thank you. Um, so just wanted to start off with, I, I don't have any conflicts of interest, but just want to disclose some funding sources. And, and I did want to take a moment to, to recognize Dr. Mendelssohn, who unfortunately uh, I never um, had the opportunity to meet, but whose influence is really felt in, in anyone who's doing clinical research in substance use disorders. Um, I certainly hear his name often when I, I come to Roger with what I think is an exciting and new idea. And I say, hey, Roger, this, there's this really cool new thing. And he says, Kate Jack did that 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> So that, that's always a humbling moment, and um, I'll be talking a bit about how do we think about treatment non-response, and how do we look to enhance on the treatment response that we have, and, and certainly Dr. Mendelssohn's work is felt in that, that we have the ability to talk about enhancing treatment response in many ways because of the really seminal work that he did, um, for example, in, in buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. We're talking about enhancing because of the foundation that he really built for many of us doing this work. Um, so, so quite an honor and very humbling to, to even um, be mentioned in the same sentence as Dr. Mendelssohn. So what I'm going to be talking about today is, is mostly our work in the area of, of stress and distress tolerance. And I want to start off talking a little bit about substance use disorder treatment response. So at sort of the top level, we have quite effective treatments for substance use disorders, both behavioral and medication-based treatments. Um, if we use the example of opioid use disorder, I actually really love this. This is the National Academy's consensus uh, study report on opioid use disorder treatment. Um, and I love that they did not bury the lead here, which is the title of this is that medications for opioid use disorder save lives, um, which there's a tremendous amount of evidence to suggest that's the case. Um, and here's actually some data from, from one of Roger's large clinical trials of treatment for prescription opioid use disorder. And this gives us both the good news and the bad news. So if you see on the left here, these are folks with a successful outcome who come in, they do detox, and then discontinue medications. On the right, you'll see folks who continue on buprenorphine. Um, and you see, you go from about a 95% poor outcome rate to about a 50% poor outcome rate. So one, that suggests that these are tremendously effective treatments, and two, this also shows that we have a very long way to go. That when you're talking about an illness like this that in many cases can be fatal, 50% of people not responding to treatment is woefully inadequate. Sure beats 95%, but we really have a long way to go. So if we think about who are the people who do and don't respond to treatment, if you actually look in the literature at what are the predictors of treatment non-response, I dare you to find anything that doesn't predict treatment response. As you can find anything. Anything bad will predict treatment non-response somewhere in the literature, which in some ways is completely useless to us if we're trying to think about how do we improve treatment response. If you really dig in, your two robust predictors are going to be age and early treatment response. So younger folks tend to do more poorly in treatment, um, and early treatment response tends to tell us who's going to do well. In many cases, who does well quickly will tell us who's going to do well in the long run. These are actually some, some data that we published a few years ago that look at folks who drop out of treatment. And what you can see here is these are the first three months of treatment, dark bars of people who drop out of treatment, the light bars of people who are retained. And you see that the folks who have more positive uh, drug screens for both opioids and other drugs are the folks who are much more likely to drop out of treatment. If you look at outcomes as well, um, and Roger's published some work in this area, that folks who continue to use opioids in the first week to two weeks of treatment are much more likely to do poorly over the long run. So again, these, these are useful pieces of information, but don't necessarily give us something to sort of wrap our arms around in terms of how do we think about picking up more treatment response. Um, and one way I think we can really think about this is what are the types of predictors that we might be looking at? And I always think of this in sort of this two by two table, is we could be looking at predictors that are stable things that aren't going to move a lot week to week. So this could be something like family history of a substance use disorder. Useful information, but it's not something that we can change. And then we also have factors that are either malleable or unmalleable. So is this something we can change? Is it something that's going to vary from, from week to week? And if we think about these stable factors, so again, this could be something like family history of a substance use disorder, age. Um, this can help us to identify who might need a specific treatment or who might need additional support. A, a really cool example of this, um, in the alcohol use disorder literature is folks who tend to drink more for um, reward. People who drink to feel good tend to respond quite well to naltrexone compared to people who tend to drink for relief who don't actually respond as well. So that's something where we can say we can characterize somebody on the front end, we might be able to pick the right treatment for them. Um, what we're more interested in in our work is what are the things that are actually malleable? 
what are the predictors of treatment response that we can actually push around with treatment to look to enhance our treatment response. Um, and, and speaking of giants in the field, I, I also want to mention this really wonderful paper by Kathy Carroll. For anyone who hasn't seen this, um, she, she wrote this really wonderful commentary on heterogeneity and substance use disorders. Um, and, and I pulled a quote from this that I really like, where she says, substance use disorders have historically defied definition through simple characterizations or models, and no single characterization has led to the development of broadly effective interventions. And really what she's arguing for here is trying to understand some of these domains of heterogeneity. What are some of these things that might actually help us to understand treatment response that we can actually target in treatment? Um, and I'm going to talk about this model just very briefly for the sake of time, but people have probably seen this model before. This is a, a model that's been posited a number of times about stages of addictive disorders, um, ranging from sort of the binge intoxication phase when people are actively using to withdrawal and negative affect, and then preoccupation anticipation, that sort of craving anticipation stage. Um, and some of the work that, that Kathy did, as well as others, including um, Roger and I were both involved in this, is to start to look at what are some dimensions of heterogeneity that we can map on onto these stages, things that we can characterize to better understand how might two people with the exact same disorder actually look very different in terms of the mechanisms that are maintaining that disorder and what we might be able to target in treatment. Um, so these are really three of the main um, sort of dimensions of heterogeneity that have been proposed. I'm going to spend the time today talking about negative affect as one of those dimensions. So if we look at this, we can look at negative affect from a number of different um, angles. So there are is the affective component, depressive anxiety symptoms, anger symptoms, reactivity to stress and distress, which I'll spend most of the time talking about today, and also psychiatric disorders. And if you look across even just these three dimensions, you see a lot of potential prediction of treatment response. Um, so these are some data. This was also a, a collaboration with Kathy and some folks down at Yale, where we looked at a, a relatively large sample of folks receiving methadone maintenance treatment and looked at what predicts who's going to do poorly. And what we see here is two things. Is one, the people with higher levels of stress are more likely to continue to use cocaine and opioids. And this appears to be mediated by depressive symptoms. What does this mean is effectively that affective response to stress, the degree to which someone has a depressive or negative affective response to stress, is explaining the impact of that stress on outcomes. If the association is a little bit stronger for opioids than cocaine, but you see it for both disorders, both in predicting end of treatment and long-term treatment outcomes. Um, similarly, if you look at people at baseline prior to coming into treatment, and this is a, just a small pilot that we had of folks with opioid use disorder who were coming in for a clinical trial, and what we do is we assess their stress in the past year, and we ask them, what's the most stressful thing that's happened to you in the past year, and develop an individualized stressor for them where they actually engage in script-driven imagery, they listen to an audio recording of that stressor, and we measure things like their physiological response, negative affect, and craving, and you see that people who listen to that recording, who have greater shift in negative affect, are also the people who are more likely to relapse. So again, keep in mind these are people we've, we've standardized the stressor, the level of stress is the same, it's very individualized. The people for whom that stress hits harder are the people who are more likely to relapse in the course of treatment. Uh, if we look at the diagnostic level, these are some PTSD data. Uh, this was a secondary data analysis of, of the um, prescription opioid addiction treatment study that I mentioned earlier. If you look at the diagnostic level, something like PTSD, really characterized by disruption in stress systems, if you come in, if you look on the right, if you don't have PTSD, whether you just get buprenorphine or you get buprenorphine and additional behavioral therapies, so individual drug counseling, doesn't really matter. You have about a 50% response rate, which is again about pretty standard for a buprenorphine treatment response rate. If you have PTSD and you just get medications, your treatment outcome, your success rate drops like a rock. So you see much lower response, suggesting this is a group that might need more. Again, there's something that just the medication isn't sufficiently targeting. So why does this work? Why are we seeing such a strong linkage here? And if you think about pretty much any substance, and, and it varies a little bit substance to substance, drugs tend to be both rewarding and to afford relief, is that you can see both positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. And really understanding some of these negative reinforcement processes might help us to target these things a little bit better. One way we can look at this is the very simple way of looking at this, which is asking people why they're using. Um, and we see this across multiple substances. I'll just highlight a couple here. These are some opioid data. This is 
across sort of the spectrum of severity. So on the left, you're looking at national data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. These are folks who have misused an opiate analgesic, so they've used more than prescribed or without a prescription. And if you actually look at the, let's see if I have a thing here. If you actually look at the top five reasons here, four of the five are relief-oriented motives. So certainly there are people who are using to, to feel high out of curiosity for euphoria, but actually the most common motives tend to be for either pain or negative affect relief. On the right, we're actually looking at folks with severe opioid use disorder, where again, you see coping with negative affect is actually the most common reported motive. Um, what we don't have here is you also see a lot of motives for uh, avoiding withdrawal. And you can think of that in many ways as another relief-oriented motive. Um, I'm not going to dig into our, our sex and gender differences work much today, but I would also note that there are loads in this domain, um, one of which you'll see here, and you see this across a number of different substances that actually women are more likely to report uh, using to cope than men. Um, we also see this, this is just another drug class, just to give another example here. Um, these are actually some data we have under review now looking at benzodiazepine and Z drug misuse. Um, so benzodiazepines being anti-anxiety medications, Z drugs being um, uh, medications used to treat sleep. So you'll see we have sort of three groups here, folks who misused benzodiazepines, folks who used, misused Z drugs, people who misuse both. And again, you're seeing a real predominance of relief-oriented motives. Um, the, the sort of Z drug stuff has been pretty understudied, but out of interest, almost everyone who is misusing a Z drug says they're doing it for sleep. So there's, there's a lot of sort of self-treatment motives here. But again, even for the benzodiazepines, where you tend to see more variable motives, a lot of these are more coping-oriented. Um, I would also note, just as, as people are looking at this, um, in general, the more motives for use, the worse the treatment outcome is. It sort of makes sense. People are using for multiple different reasons. So where might we see some, some opportunities to understand this heterogeneity? If you think about the literature and substance use disorders, we know that these are disorders that tend to be characterized by heightened reward seeking and also lessened ability to learn from punishment, which is a bad combination. So a tendency to seek reward and difficulty actually learning from consequences. So when you see that cost-benefit ratio flip, which at some point it will, the inability to adjust behavior, when this is actually bringing more cost than benefit. Um, what we're really interested in is, is there variability in sensitivity to relief? Are there people for whom that relief is actually um, more reinforcing? which gets to this concept of distress intolerance, um, which you can think of as having sort of two pieces. It's a little bit sort of complex cognitive concept where part of it is sensitivity to distress. So you can think of this as, I can't handle this, this is bad, this is dangerous, which tends to amplify distress. And, and probably everybody can relate to this in some way. When you have that sense, pain is always a good example here. When you have the sense if you interpret that pain as bad or dangerous or reflecting something bad, it tends to actually make it worse. So you think of this as sort of amplifying the distress, which comes hand in hand with this lack of persistence. If this is bad, if this is scary, if I can't handle it, I need to get rid of it. And when do I need to get rid of it? I need to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Um, and I would note this isn't specific to substance use disorders. We see this really with most of the maladaptive behaviors that we are interested in clinically fit into this sort of quick fix immediate negative reinforcement um, category. Certainly, things like non-suicidal self-injury would fit into this category, anxious avoidance and anxiety disorders. Um, and in many ways, you can think of this as an anxious response to stress and distress, is that I feel stress, I feel distress, and I have an anxious response to that. So where do we see this? We see this in a lot of different places, really across the continuum of opioid misuse. I would say the one thing we haven't looked at, although it is, is on the list, is are people with higher distress intolerance more likely to be prescribed opioids? So do you get actually a difference in exposure? I would suspect we do, but, but we haven't studied that yet. People with psychiatric disorders are somewhere between two and four times more likely to be prescribed an opioid, also more likely to be prescribed high-dose opioids. So I would suspect we see it, but we certainly also see linkage both at the, the early end of the severity spectrum, so misuse of opioid analgesics among people with pain and also in severe opioid use disorder. Um, just to zip through a few pieces of data here, this was, this was something we did in collaboration with um, some folks at Brigham and Women's a few years ago, uh, where we looked at folks who were prescribed opioids long term, who had chronic pain. Um, and what you see is whether um, using either self-report or behavioral measures of distress and tolerance, these are both highly predictive of who is more likely to misuse their medications. 
So what actually distinguishes someone who can have chronic pain, take their medications as prescribed, and who actually will escalate and start to overuse their medication or use additional opioids, this is one of the factors that actually appears to be a pretty strong predictor. It's also consistent with other data that suggests things like depression and psychiatric factors actually appear to be the thing that sort of links pain to substance misuse. And you think about that distress about pain being the real predictor. Uh, we also see this in, in severe opioid use disorder. One of the, the things that we did a number of years ago was look at whether do we just see these affective vulnerabilities because you tend to have a high psychiatric loading in people with substance use disorders or lots of psychiatric disorders. And even if you control for mood and anxiety disorders and you measure this in every way we could think of under the sun, you still see elevated distress and tolerance in people with opioid use disorder. We've used behavioral economic measures, self-report, behavioral. Um, we've looked at different types of distress. So does pain differ from things like anxiety or sadness? Across the board, you see this real elevation in opioid use disorder. And if you think about what's really sort of the mechanism here, this really comes back to the idea of motivation. Again, that motivation for relief. Um, and I'm not going to dig into these data for the sake of time, but if you think of craving as an indicator of the motivational state for use, and certainly we've published a number of studies that show Craving shifts week to week will predict likelihood of use of alcohol, of opioids in the subsequent week. This can be a nice indicator of what is that motivational state. And we see that people with more distress and tolerance have more craving in general, and in particular, in laboratory studies where you either induce pain or stress, have more craving in response to pain or stress. So again, you see this real amplification of the motivational state. Um, and also, just to mention this quickly, and um, I won't dig into this as a collaboration with Alex Milner, for anybody who knows Alex, who was an intern here um, and, and is over at Harvard now, and he would need to explain this task to you because it is tremendously complicated and I am terrible at explaining it, but effectively what you're looking at here is folks with substance use disorders, so we brought in folks with opioid use disorder and people without substance use disorders, and we looked at can they learn in, in sort of a novel task, cognitive-based task, can they learn what response will afford them relief? So people come in, um, I don't know if, if anybody in the lab has had to do this yet, if you haven't, um, sign yourself up. Um, they listen to an awful noise on headphones. And that comes on and you have a certain response that will make that noise go away, and a certain response that will make that noise go away. <laughs> Speaking of awful noises, it's worse than that. <laughs> Much worse than that. Um, and people with substance use disorders are able to learn. They're able to learn the contingency. But when that contingency changes, there's an inability to change behavior. So what does this mean? That you can learn what behavior is going to get you relief, but when that stops working, the ability to change behavior is impaired. And again, if you think about this clinically, this really fits what we see and what I think we hear a lot from people, which is this worked for a while and then it stopped working, but I'm still doing it. That inability to shift, and I think what, what these data show is that's not just sort of the, the, the story that we make or the narrative we put around it, but we actually see this deficit at a cognitive level. So can we actually do something about this? Can we change distress and tolerance? This is some data that we actually collected the Behavioral Health Partial. This is a, a collaboration with, um, with Courtney Beard and with some other folks at the BHP. This is a pretty, for folks who aren't familiar with it, great program, loads of evidence-based treatment, CBT, DBT-based predominantly. Um, and we can see in even sort of standard CBT and DBT that's not specifically targeted to distress intolerance, you can see substantial changes, and you also see that those changes are associated with the degree of clinical improvement. So this is something that we're probably moving around in our current CBT, DBT-based programs already. Um, I'll talk in a minute about how we might target this a little bit more precisely, but certainly on the top level, we can move this, and moving this does seem to improve clinical symptoms. So I want to spend the rest of our time really talking about some of the work here in benzodiazepines that we've done. I think this is a really nice example of not only where do we see this affective vulnerability really linked to use of a particular drug, but how can we start to push it around. So for folks who aren't as familiar with benzodiazepines, these are treatments for things like anxiety and insomnia. Um, very commonly prescribed. You see more than 1 in 20 people are prescribed a benzodiazepine in any given year. I have not seen data in the last couple of years. I would suspect this has gone up in the last three years. Um, there's a little bit of evidence to suggest that that number of prescriptions have gone up, but um, certainly one of the most commonly prescribed medications. And one question has historically been, can they be misused? And some of the early studies really said, 
no, they don't, they don't really seem to be that rewarding. People probably aren't going to misuse them. Um, Shelley will appreciate that, of course, when those studies were done, who was not included in those studies but women. Um, those are almost predominantly done in men and, and many years ago, so there probably needs to be a little bit of an update on that. Um, but in general, these are less rewarding than other substances. There can be reward, certainly, when combined with other drugs, but in many ways, these are substances much more of relief than of reward. Um, and interestingly, benzodiazepines and sort of related sedatives are the third most commonly misused illicit or prescribed drug. So these are data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. You can see, aside from alcohol and tobacco, uh, cannabis is the most common, followed by opioid analgesics, and then tranquilizers and sedatives. This is almost exclusively benzodiazepines. The Z drugs are in there. There's a smattering of other things, but this really is predominantly benzodiazepine misuse. So this is very common at a population level. Um, these are also some recent data that we have that suggests that many people are able to take these drugs as prescribed. For the vast majority of people, they can take these safely. Um, so you'll see here, and I, we actually separated out benzodiazepines from Z drugs. These are folks who used only, so it could be used by prescription. The lighter bars here are people who misused. So you'll see for both drug classes, the vast majority of people can take these safely, but there's not an insubstantial subgroup of people who are going to overuse these medications. Um, a slightly different way of looking at the same data, because this helps me wrap my head around it a little bit better. Of the people who used a benzodiazepine in the past year, a little under 18% misused it. It's a lot of people. When, again, when you think about how prevalent these substances are, it's about half that for Z drugs. Um, if you look at use disorder, again, you, your number gets a lot smaller. So the people who are really hit hard by this and have enough to have a use disorder, it's only about 2% of the people who have used in the past year. But again, when you're talking about a large number of prescriptions, this is a lot of people. And who are the vulnerable populations? Unfortunately, these are the two populations that are most likely to be prescribed these medications. So on the left, we see folks with substance use disorders. This is also some national survey data from National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Um, we have alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder in the combo, and lifetime and past year benzodiazepine misuse. So you see about 70% of people with an opioid use disorder have misused a benzodiazepine in their lifetime. Tremendously prevalent. Um, it, it is of note that if you combine a benzodiazepine with an opioid, it will boost the effect. So this is certainly part of it, and there were some early studies in methadone that suggested that benzodiazepines were commonly misused to sort of boost the effect of the methadone. Um, but even in alcohol use disorder, and this I think really flies under the radar, more than a quarter of people with an alcohol use disorder report that they've misused a benzodiazepine in their lifetime. We, we did some qualitative work a couple years back um, asking people, why are you misusing benzodiazepines? What are some of the reasons? Um, and it was really fascinating to hear just a tremendous range of things, including, and I'm, I'm sure many of the clinicians in the, the audience have heard, um, the term chew your booze was a term that we heard a lot, which is, I drink at night, and I use benzos during the day to get through the day. So oftentimes you'll see it as a replacement. Um, and, and we heard, again, just fascinating things about how people might combine benzodiazepines with other substances to either enhance or decrease an unwanted anxiety effect, including in, in combination with cannabis. It's taking sort of high THC cannabis products with a benzodiazepine to dampen some of the um, anxiolytic effect of the cannabis. So you see people with substance use disorders are at much higher risk compared to those population base rates. This is also some data from, from the BHP where we looked at benzodiazepine misuse in folks with psychiatric disorders. Um, much less prevalent, but you see still a little bit more than a quarter of people reported misusing their benzodiazepines. And this is something in, in, in talking with a lot of the folks that this was just not on the radar. Um, most of its low level use, you'll see for most people they reported this is rare, but certainly this is something that is, that is in the mix. And um, from colleagues who do work with adolescents, um, they will certainly say that the sharing of benzodiazepines is a major issue, not only among adolescents, but actually parents sharing their benzodiazepines with adolescents. I think there's, there's in many ways, a lot of misperceptions about potential risks with, with this medication. Um, and similarly to, to what we saw with opioids, the vast majority of reasons for misuse are for self-treatment. These are relief motives. So again, this, these are the psychiatric um, folks, the BHP data. Most common reason for misusing was anxiety, depression. Again, you will see some sort of more enhancement motives in the mix to get high and out of curiosity. But for many people, this really is a relief-oriented motive. Same thing with the folks with substance use disorders. So if we look in our substance use disorder samples, um, we looked at both, why did you start misusing a benzodiazepine? More than half reported for coping or relief-oriented motives. And if you ask them, why are you misusing now? Again, coping was the most common. So you're really seeing this is 
Again, although there can be some enhancement, some boost of other substances, this is really people using to manage that negative affect that's not being otherwise managed sufficiently. Um, so anxiety sensitivity, um, I, I know some people will argue around this very similar concept to distress intolerance. You can think of it as a little bit more specific to anxiety symptoms and sensations. So the degree to which uh, people have an anxious response to anxiety symptoms. We've also replicated several times a linkage between this and benzodiazepine misuse. Um, I know I said I wouldn't talk much about the, the gender findings, but this is one where it's actually pretty stark, um, is we've seen uh, twice in opioid use disorder. So this is opioid use disorder folks in methanol maintenance. Uh, this is opioid use disorder. These are folks on our detox unit on Proctor 1. Uh, alcohol use disorder, folks with alcohol use disorder on Proctor 1. And you see a really strong link in actually even a, almost sort of a, uh, a time-dependent way. Both presence of benzodiazepine misuse and days of benzodiazepine misuse are associated with anxiety sensitivity only in women. Um, so this was one of those things where when we, this is actually, this first study here is actually relatively old. This is from 2011, I think. Um, when we first found that, I thought, eh, maybe we should publish it, maybe we shouldn't. It's, it's, it's probably a, a finding if we ran the study 100 times, maybe we'd see it 50 times. We've since replicated it twice. So there really does seem to be some kind of gender-specific link here that we're, we're very interested in digging into more. Um, and would certainly welcome any thoughts that folks have about that. The other thing that we've looked at, again, if we're thinking about this motivational state, is how does this impact craving? So we looked at craving in a slightly different way here which is to look at cue-induced craving. So cue-induced craving or cue reactivity is something that's been shown for any substance of abuse. Um, you see it in alcohol, you see it in opioids, you, you name the drug, it's been studied. Interestingly, it's never been studied in benzodiazepines. This was a study we, we just published. And effectively, what you're looking at is when someone is exposed to a reminder of substance use. So if someone with an alcohol use disorder sees a, a pint of beer, or sees someone with an opioid use disorder sees um, some Percocet, you tend to get both an anxiety response and a craving response to that. Sort of makes sense, is when you're exposed to that thing, you're gonna get a little bit of a craving boost, at times a very substantive craving boost. Um, so we looked at in folks with benzodiazepines, if we show them images of benzodiazepines, will they have this same response? And again, these have historically been thought of as drugs with lower misuse liability. These aren't gonna look the same as something like alcohol or opioids might. So we figured we have, we have no idea what to expect, what's gonna happen when we actually um, show these to folks and ask them what's your level of craving, what's your level of anxiety. Um, and what you see here uh, on the right, so these are, uh, the dark bars are the benzodiazepine stimuli, so the images of pills and related um, pill bottles, neutral or sort of matched neutral images. You see uh, on the far right here, this is salience, which means how much do these images remind you of times that you've misused. This is just a little bit of a manipulation check, um, which show that this really did remind people of times that they've used. And you see actually really large increases in both craving and anxiety when people see these images. So what does this actually mean is if, it, if you're someone who's struggling with benzodiazepine misuse, so these are all, I should mention, these are all folks who misused benzodiazepines in the past three months. If you're struggling with this and you see it in a medicine cabinet or on a commercial, your level, that motivational state for use is going to go up. Um, I, I would also note, and this is, um, didn't put it up here because it's a little bit of comparing apples to oranges, but just, just in terms of magnitude, this is a similar increase in craving to what we've seen in opioid use disorder, which I'll be honest, shocked me a little bit. And we certainly need to replicate it and look at it more, but the, the size of these effects was comparable to folks with opioid use disorder who use uh, via um, injection. So this is actually was much larger than we ever would have expected. The thing that was interesting to me, so typically Q reactivity is gonna be associated with severity is that people who are more severe are gonna have more Q reactivity, makes sense. If your disorder is more severe, you're gonna be more triggered by seeing these images. We actually didn't see that in this study. So if we look at these markers of severity, days of use, duration of use, severity of use, it's actually not associated with Q reactivity. What was, was distress intolerance, measured a couple different ways. You see a really robust effect here where people with greater intolerance of distress had greater Q reactivity, um, and insomnia, sort of makes sense. These are also medications that can be used to, to treat insomnia. So effectively, the folks for whom they have greater intolerance of that negative affective state, these cues are really more potent in terms of um, generating craving, generating a little bit of an affective response. So certainly more to come on this, but um, that certainly surprised me. So if we think about, can we actually target this more specifically with treatment? So again, as I mentioned before, 
most cognitive behavioral treatments will sort of address this idea, again, enhancing tolerance of distress, trying to build both alternative skills, if you think about those two pieces of distress and tolerance, build alternative ways of responding to distress, and also changing the way that people are sort of interpreting their distress. We change both of those. Can we actually target this in a more specific way? And I want to use the example of something sort of very related, which is tapering people off of benzodiazepines. So there was a bunch of work done. Uh, Michael Otto, who's actually one of my um, mentors in grad school, di did a bunch of this work, um, where folks who are trying to taper off of a benzodiazepine, so people who have been prescribed it, not necessarily people who are misusing, but people who are trying to discontinue a prescription, it can be tremendously difficult. Um, and I, I see some head nodding of people who have probably tried to do this before. Usually you have to go very slowly to sort of help people get off of the, the medication safe, safely and successfully. And the people who actually really struggle with this are also the people who have similar risk factors here, the higher distress intolerance. So we know that for people who are more afraid of or reactive to the withdrawal symptoms, who are more anxious about their anxiety symptoms, are the people who both are very reticent to taper and the people who have a much higher, harder time tapering off of their medications. Um, so you can think of this as almost an amplified response to withdrawal. So when you're withdrawing from something like a benzodiazepine, it feels a lot like the thing that you were trying to treat to begin with. It feels like the anxiety. And that sense of amplified response can be really difficult. Um, so this is something that um, has been shown in a couple studies to, to be effective. Effectively, what you're looking at here is you are treating that anxiety of the withdrawal symptoms. The way that you do this is uh, interceptive exposure. So for folks who aren't familiar with this, interceptive exposure is used in many ways to treat panic disorder and also some other anxiety disorders where you're looking at that fear response to your own internal sensations. So for example, if you feel like when your heart is racing or when you're short of breath, if you have that intolerant response of that, if you have that anxious response to that, it tends to amplify that symptom. So you imagine you're trying to do something like taper off of a a medication that might create some of these withdrawal symptoms, you have a little bit of that symptom and it, it jacks up your anxiety. Um, interestingly, there's, there's been some, some recent work, um, Kelly Dunn down at, at Johns Hopkins and some other folks have looked a lot at fear of withdrawal, actually predicting outcomes in detox. And those, again, those folks who have more fear of those withdrawal symptoms tend to have a much harder time. So this treatment, effectively what you're doing is you're going in and you're exposing people to those symptoms that they are afraid of. Um, and, and Oliver Boganovich and I have, have actually uh, done this a fair bit in our outpatient clinic for folks who are misusing benzodiazepines or trying to, to taper, where what you'll do is you bring somebody in and you figure out what are those symptoms that are going to be bothersome to them, and you expose people to those symptoms in a safe environment to help them build better tolerance of that distress, to help extinguish that fear response to that distress, um, along with slow taper. So, I'm going to just briefly present some results of an RCT um, that we wrote up a se several years ago where it looked at just slow taper alone versus what many people would think, and, and certainly I would have thought on its surface would be a great idea. So these are people who are sort of really amped up. Let's just give them good behavioral relaxation. Let's sort of drop some of those withdrawal symptoms. Let's see if we can drop the overall level of withdrawal, or let's do the taper plus the interceptive exposure. So what do you actually see? So let me walk you through this. So here are your three conditions. This is the, the interceptive exposure treatment. This is relaxation, and this is just taper. So everybody gets a slow taper. And what you see, this is percent successful taper. The CBT treatment not only had the most success in terms of the taper, but the most sustained su success out through six months. The really cool piece here, um, if, if you're an exposure therapy nerd like myself, is that the folks in the CBT condition also actually reported the highest withdrawal symptoms. So, so what does that actually mean? The people with relax, who did the relaxation condition did actually relax away some of those withdrawal symptoms, but also did the worst. So in other words, what you're seeing here is the CBT treatment didn't necessarily drop the level of withdrawal, it didn't have much impact. What it was presumably impacting was that fear of withdrawal, is that sense that I can actually tolerate it in a way that helps sustain that taper out through six months. So again, these are data in folks who were not necessarily misusing benzodiazepines. These were folks who were prescribed. Um, would this look very different in sort of a misuse or sedative use disorder population where you're going to get more ambivalence around that, that taper potentially? Who knows, but I think this is a really important potential target for us to be considering moving forward. So I did want to just end on a, a couple quick notes just in terms of future directions, sort of where, where are we going next with this? Um, and, and this is really a big focus of, of what we're doing in the lab. Um, 
Much of what we're looking at is how can we enhance behavioral therapies. Again, how do we, how do we look to target behavior therapies to the things that make up that 50% of people who aren't responding? Um, so we're doing some work with co-occurring anxiety disorders um, and also some, some work looking at are there certain predictors of what types of behavioral and cognitive strategies people might need? So one of the things we're really interested in are, are people who have greater difficulty with executive function and cognitive control, do they actually need different strategies than someone whose cognitive control is more intact? So if you think of something like a cognitive reappraisal, so sort of re rethinking your, your um, automatic negative thoughts takes a fair bit of, of cognitive energy. And if you're someone who, for whatever reason, that executive function is not really on board, is that just not going to work? Is it not going to stick? Do we need something simpler? So we're really, we're really trying to look at some of those heterogeneity factors. We're also looking at heterogeneity and treatment response. We have a project now that's looking at who might do OK with just buprenorphine among folks with opioid use disorder versus who might really benefit from the addition of behavior therapy. Um, so stay tuned on that one. Um, and also, I didn't mention much of our pain work, but it's really related to much of what I talked about today, where we're looking at, can we actually manipulate the link between pain and substance use by decreasing pain-related anxiety? Um, so this is the thing that I think sometimes gets um, uh, underemphasized when we talk about pain and opioids, is the thing that appears to link pain to opioid problems, misuse, medication overuse, is really that fear of pain, that pain-related anxiety. That seems to be sort of the key factor there. Um, and, and that's been consistently replicated in the literature. So we're looking to see if we can push that around. Um, and then one new study that we're really excited about, and this is a collaboration with, with Roger and other folks in the NIDA Clinical Trials Network, is really looking to characterize a long-term course of opioid use disorder um, over hopefully the very long term. And one of the things we're really interested in here is, again, some of that heterogeneity and course heterogeneity and predictors of treatment response. We'll be looking at a lot of affective variables in that as well. So stay tuned. Um, and one last note before I kick us to questions, I, because we talked a lot about individual level factors today, about how at an individual level we might think about potential therapeutic targets. And, and this is a figure that I really like. This is, this is a colleague at, at MGH, um, Muhammad Jalali. Um, this is something we published a few years ago, which sort of depicts, fr from an opioid perspective, a socio-ecological framework. And, and the reason why I put this up is just to suggest that as much as we really are focused on the individual level and trying to enhance treatment response at the individual level, these are disorders that happen within a tremendously complicated and multi-layered context. Um, and certainly, if we're looking at outcomes like overdose, um, Anything we could do at the individual level is also going to pair, pale in comparison to things that need to be done from, from a broader level. Um, they're doing some tremendously interesting work with um, modeling and, and system science approaches to understanding what levers can we actually pull to really turn the tide, particularly on overdoses. And oftentimes it has to do with things like drug supply. Um, access to housing, access to health insurance. So as much as we really are focused on the individual level, I think it's so important. Um, and to circle back, Dr. Mendelssohn's work in, in doing sort of multidisciplinary collaborations, I think was just such a wonderful example of this, that we really do need to be thinking of this not just at the individual level, but in terms of these multiple layers. And I managed to do that on time. So just want to acknowledge, so this is, this is the, the many, many people who were involved in the data that I presented today, folks in the lab, mentors, collaborators. Um, just so grateful to, to the whole team. And um, really, we, we have a wonderful crew in the lab right now who are working their tails off on this stuff and um, hopefully, hopefully starting to move forward. Thank you. That was just a fabulous talk. Just uh, people who are here in this room, which the people who are live streaming can't see, are all nodding when I said that was a fabulous talk. <laughs> so it was. It was fabulous. And I think you can see why we really feel so fortunate um, that we have uh, Dr. McHugh here and that she's our recipient of the Jack Mendelson Award. I know for a fact, and Roger would confirm, that he would be he would have found that talk awesome, and he also would have just been very proud of the work that you're doing. It really does, in fact, reflect a lot of what he you know, laid the foundation for so that we could go forward and, and do better for these patients and understand much more about the neurobiology. So we're so grateful. The other thing I just wanted to say about why we're also grateful is that after a national search, um, 
uh, Kate was offered and she accepted the chief of psychology position at McLean Hospital, and we're also incredibly grateful for your leadership in that domain as well. And with that, you know, if you would step forward, I really do want to read the plaque, and I'm going to give it to you, and we're going to do a little photo op, and we do have time for Q&A, but we're going to do this first while we're here. So I just wanted to read this, that this is um, the... Mendelssohn Memorial Research Award presented to Dr. McHugh for outstanding contributions to multidisciplinary research on the biological and behavioral bases of addiction. And with that, you know, I just one more round of applause here. Kate, present this. Like we like each other. <laughs> Quickly, quickly. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, with that, we do really have time for questions. And um, uh, Dr. Palmer is going to um, uh, moderate the Q&A along with um, uh, Marge Overheiser. So I'm going to move and allow you back here. So this is for you. If anybody has any questions, raise your hand. Hi, Kate. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much, and congratulations on your award. Um, so I was wondering if there are any significant differences between tapering off of opioids versus tapering off of benzodiazepines. I'm just not as familiar with um, the taper process for that. Yes, yeah, so, so, so I can give you the psychologist's answer to that while, while I try not to make eye contact with the 20 addiction psychiatrists uh, and, and nurses in the room. Um, so... It's um, some overlap, some differences. So in, in terms of the taper, it's actually interesting. Um, you know, Hillary Connery and I have talked a bunch about this, about whether actually a fear of withdrawal protocol might actually be really useful for opioid taper. The place where I, I'm actually really curious in that is that buprenorphine taper, that sort of very end of the buprenorphine taper that people tend to have a really hard time with. Could we actually help people get over the hump of that very last uh, sort of drop in dose with a, a more distress intolerance based treatment. Um, so I think that there are a lot of similarities. Certainly anxiety is part of the withdrawal syndrome for both. Um, although the, the withdrawal syndrome, syndrome for benzodiazepines tends to be a little bit more anxiety predominant. But I think there's possibility for looking at opioids as well. And there's actually a little bit of data, and this is a, a very different animal, but there's actually a little bit of data that this type of approach can help people to taper off of antidepressants as well for people who actually have a lot of um, difficulty tapering off of antidepressants. Again, very, very different taper process, but the, the fear of withdrawal and fear of that discomfort component is going to be pretty consistent across anything that's going to have any aversive withdrawal symptom. Thank you. Thanks, Eleanor. Hi there. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. This is a question inspired by the work of, of Kristin Neff on mindful self-compassion. And the way I'm thinking about this is that distress, as distressing as it is, is of course also the, the foundation to be compassionate with others. And, and like, since we know that, that the um, social effects, mutual help groups are so effective for some people, I wonder whether one could like actually, first of all, find out to what degree is a person more self-compassionate or not, which of course Kristin Neff taught us how to measure, and then specifically address that both on the individual level, but also then even see whether the group, inter the inter-social interactions that come out of that might actually be like reinforcing abstinence, sobriety, recovery. Great, great question. And actually, Shelley would have thoughts on that, and I, and I would have a hard time citing the paper that we worked on this that actually showed that affiliation, and, and throw something at me if I'm getting this wrong, but affiliation among group members in her women's recovery groups uh, study was actually associated with better outcome. So the more people made supportive statements with each other, please, please yell if I'm wrong, Shelley, or if I'm oversimplifying. You're, you're, getting, you're, you're, you're actually getting it right, but I would just add that it's actually what we showed was that affiliation in any group mixed gender or all women's actually um, predicted better outcomes the more you were exposed. But if you had a high affiliation and you were a woman in a woman's recovery group, you had the best. Um, uh, so, and do you have another question? Because I wanted to segue into something if, it's, if that's okay. 
I, I just, if, do you mind if I ask you this question and just make a comment about that incredibly impressive um, slide that you showed about the gender differences in terms of the benzodiazepine and stress? Yeah. And you know what it reminds me of, and it would be worth thinking about, is the um, is the work that was published about two years ago by Carolyn Rodriguez that showed that COVID-related stress and distress increased drinking amongst women but not men through a period of time. So if you were distressed um, you know, uh, from COVID and you were female, your level of alcohol use and consumption and days of use actually accelerated um, throughout a period of time and not if you were male. So it's just interesting because of the benzodiazepines and wondering about that as well. It's so interesting because it also runs into the question of not all stress is created equal. And certain types of stress are going to land harder than others. Caretaking stress be, being on the list of things that are going to land harder than others. Discrimination-based stress being another one that's going to land harder. So I think as we're looking at this, when we also see sex and gender differences in the type of stress level exp of stress and exposure to stress, you're also going to see that there's, there's both the reaction and there's the input, both of which, which will certainly push you. And part of what makes it actually really hard to study is that if you're talking about stress that's gonna impact people in different levels in addition to potential differences in that reactivity to stress. Um, tremendously complicated. No one back here. Hi, Kate. Uh, excellent talk, thank you so much. Um, I was just kind of wondering when you were talking about the, you know, that stress at the end of the opiate taper, I'm wondering now with fentanyl really being a much harder detox, cow scores going up higher before they hit threshold where we can give them the buprenorphine. And do you think there's any um, studies that are gonna come out or any work that we would do to kind of see how that CBT early on while we're trying to get them to the point of either giving them methadone and then bridge them to buprenorphine or doing something like that to help them through that time? Because that seems to be the hardest time on the unit. That's, it's so interesting to hear, because in many ways that, that fear of what's gonna happen is brutal. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely brutal. So that, that sense of not only is that gonna make that anticipation bad, potentially lead to, I would imagine at times people discharging early or or engaging in other behaviors that you might not want on the unit. So there's, there's that piece. And then if you come in with that level of anticipatory anxiety, that withdrawal is almost certainly gonna actually hit you harder too. It's again, you get the anxiety on top of the withdrawal worsens the whole thing. Um, so I, yeah, I would actually love to, I actually think I'm talking about anxiety um, on Proctor One in a couple of weeks on that Thursday talk. So I, I would love to talk about that in particular, because I think if, if there's an opportunity for us to think about, can we even get in just some, some very small behavioral interventions or a little bit of skill on that end? Can we, can we maybe cushion that a little bit for folks? Because that's anticipatory anxiety is brutal, absolutely brutal. And it's going to make that process worse for folks. Thanks, Kayla. Roger, did you have your hand up? Yeah. So I, I was interested in the misuse of benzodiazepines among people who were being prescribed them. And it was usually for the reason that they were being prescribed them, which makes me wonder, were these folks underdosed? Um, and then, you know, because a lot of people, a lot of prescribers, whether it's for opioids or benzos, say, okay, I'll do it, but I won't give you very much. Um, maybe yeah. they don't give them enough. And in general, they're not gonna add something like CBT to it as well, which could also make a difference. But it, I just wonder about, about that issue. It, this is, I think in some ways, one of the trickiest things about trying to characterize prescription drug misuse at all, which is where do we set the bar? And, and what's useful versus not? If we look at use of anything else, and if you look at even at the, you know, the surveillance data, we look at how many people used cocaine in the past year, how many people used cannabis in the past year. When we're looking at prescription drugs, we're trying to find some kind of bar that we're gonna declare non-prescribed use. Um, and I think there's been a lot of criticism about some of the misuse definitions, meaning if, if I take one extra Percocet, then my doctor said after I have my wisdom teeth taken out, I, I fall into that category. And is there any value there or not? Um, so I think that that whole area is certainly an issue with the level of people who are misusing. I mean, even the, the Z drug stuff, 90% of people saying they're misusing a Z drug for sleep. Is that the people aren't, people are being underdosed a little bit or maybe need a little bit more? Um, 
I, I think that's certainly possible. We, we have a, a paper that just came out that actually looked at, so National Survey on Drug Use and Health um, broadened their definition of prescription drug misuse in 2015, I think it was. And we looked at if you actually widen the net, do you get a very different cohort of people? Um, and we looked at a number, number of different clinical indicators, like are we truly catching people who don't have any substance use disorders, don't have a lot of psychiatric history, and they're just using a little bit of extra medication? Um, and what we actually saw is this tends to be a group that's using a lot of substances. There's a ton of poly substance use um, across a number of different domains, including other prescription drug misuse. So I think even though the motives tend to skew relief oriented, a lot of this is folks who will tend to, if they do feel like something is being undertreated, there's going to be not a lot of reticence to reach for something, even if it's not prescribed. But uh, that's an area I think that we really need to dig into more and really understand. Um, is it a is a dosing issue? Is it a, these are folks who actually might need behavior therapy in addition or instead of, or, or is this actually more of a, a pattern of, of broader substance use? Um, that that I don't think we know the answer to yet. Any others? Any other questions? No. Seeing none, let's maybe have one final round of applause. Thanks, everybody.